Hi, I'm Dave Taddeo and this is Coders Tech. This is episode 4 and it's Saturday, November 9th, 2013. Today I'm going to do a little something a little different. I'm going to take a break from the design um, series that I was doing. I was going to do partial reflectors today, uh, but I'm going to put that off until episode 5. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is I'd like to catch up on some emails that I've got and talk about a few other things that kind of uh, came across the wire, so to speak. So the first thing I'm going to get to today is uh, an email I got about uh, um, the first episode of uh, Coders Tech that I did a few weeks ago. And the person wanted to know a little bit more about automation and really what automation with the FTG software uh, design suite uh, can do for them in the lab and in engineering and in production and so on. So I, I'm going to actually draw this out so that it's a, a little more clear because as I thought about uh, the answer to this question or how to reply to this person, uh, I thought the best way to do it is to draw it out. Okay? So I think the easiest way to answer the question the person asked was if they have someone in engineering, uh, that just cut off my head, uh, if they have someone in engineering, let's call this engineering, and you've got film star design on a computer, um, they can do some design work, uh, some uh, reports, uh, and set certain things up and upload that to the company server. And once that's there on the server, it's available to everybody uh, across the company, wherever you are, as long as they have a, a computer that's uh, accessing the network. So the engineer has done some design work and set, sent the design to the server for that particular uh, product. Then in the coding department, we have a coding machine. And maybe we have a couple of coding machines. Maybe even three coding machines or four or five, depending on how big your company is and how, uh, how much work you guys are doing. And each coding machine can either have monitor from Filmstar or from FTG software, or it can have Xtail. Both of these products, monitor and Xtail, will monitor and or control um, the deposition that you're doing for the design that the engineer has sent to the server and stored on the server. So the engineer or someone in production, maybe the supervisor, can set up the monitoring and the Xtail in order to run the production in those coding machines. And so all of this can be stored on the server. After the, the coding run is done in this particular coding machine, let's say, uh, the results of that can be uploaded to the server to the same file that the design sits in. Uh, you can call that file maybe whatever the run number was, whatever the case may be, the date. And you can keep track of uh, the actual run that corresponds with the design from the engineer. Once that's done, you can go over to the spectrophotometer in the lab, sitting on a bench, spectrophotometer, and it can be running measure. And once you measure the coding run that you did here in this coding machine using either Monitor or Xtail or both, and from the design from the engineer, this measure file can be sent to the server as well to sit within the same file folder, call it a file name with the date and the run number and so on. And there it will reside forever uh, in correspondence with everything that's going on in the lab. And each one of these uh, software packages or software um, products from FTG software has automation in them. If you uh, go back to uh, Coders Tech episode one and look at how automation is done using uh, BASIC, you can make uh, graphs, you can make Excel sheets, you can make um, reports, uh, whatever you need to do with Word, whatever the case may be. All of these things can work in conjunction together and really streamline 
your production process, especially your file keeping. All of these files that correspond with a particular design, a particular product, a particular customer, uh, when you do that coding run, when you measure that sample, you can label the sample, uh, you know, sample one, two, three, for coding run A, B, C, in coding machine five, that corresponds with design number seven, eight, nine, uh, on such and such a date, November 9th. Once all that's saved on the server there, it can be accessed by management, supervisors, uh, the coding technicians and technologists that need to go back and look what they were doing previously. And it can also be accessed by uh, quality, quality assurance, quality control. They can go back and see what was done yesterday, last year, two years ago. And uh, you can really build up a really good um, set of data for each machine, for each design, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the automation with all of these products, design, monitor, Excel, measure, um, all hooked up to the same company server, really, really streamlines um, your production flow and your file keeping especially. And remember to back up, because if this goes down, then you've lost it all. So back up, back up, back up. Uh, but really, this really makes things a lot easier uh, for everybody, especially they came from the same um, software developer, FTG Software. Uh, support is great. You can find them at FG, ftgsoftware.com. I'll put that up on the screen here so you can get that, ftgsoftware.com. If you have any questions about any of these, uh, you can email me at davetaddy at coderstech.com. I'd be happy to answer them uh, and hopefully get you on your way to streamlining your uh, production process. Okay, go to my website, uh, coderstech.com. You can find me in the contact page um, and, and get to me from there as well. Okay. Okay. For the next piece of email uh, that I got, I got a, a, an email from, uh, I got a couple of emails actually. I got two emails uh, about the definitions I talked about for CVD, PVD, uh, PE, CVD, and so on in the last episode of Coders Tech that I did. Um, this particular email came from Ron, Ron Willie, uh, who uh, does what I do. He's a cons uh, thin films consultant, training. Uh, he's been doing it for many, many years. Um, and he wrote to me uh, asking me about where I got my uh, definitions from and uh, gave me his definitions, which were excellent. Um, and not only that, but posted uh, a citation about those definitions. So I looked at them. They were similar, but uh, different enough to um, different uh, different enough in the definition that when you looked at them, uh, you could categorize them differently. Um, I also got another email from someone um, who didn't get back to me when I responded about the email. Uh, very similar question. Um, they thought the definitions were uh, something else. Um, if you go back and look at episode three. I take those definitions as literal. PVD is physical vapor deposition. CVD is uh, chemical vapor deposition. The difference being physical vapor deposition is the actual physical vapor deposition of a material where you take, for example, magnesium fluoride, melt it, evaporate it. What you get is magnesium fluoride. Chemical vapor deposition being you're melting a material on the way up. It's, uh, you need to do something to make sure that you get the uh, desired material depositing on your substrates. And the example I used was titanium oxide, for example, where when you melt it, there's a, a significant dissociation at the source. You need to add oxygen into the chamber. And uh, by doing so, you're supplying enough oxygen for the uh, titanium oxide to become TiO2, which is typically what we want. Uh, in uh, optical thin films. Um, very good. Uh, so what I want to do from that is uh, ask you what you think the definitions are. I went and looked at the um, uh, Wikipedia, which Ron uh, asked me to look at, and uh, the definitions are slightly different than uh, what I gave you last week. Um, but there's another uh, 
source that I want to show you, which comes from Dan, uh, Don Maddox. Um, he's with uh, SVG, or sorry, SVC, Society of Vacuum Coders. And he has a, I'm going to share my screen here, so bear with me for a second. Okay. And he has a book called um, History of Vacuum Coding. And uh, History of Vacuum Coding was written a few years ago, uh, but it also starts off with a, an introduction um, to vacuum coding, and as you can see here, there's some, it starts off with the definitions of CVD and PVD, and what those mean, and how they were brought about, uh, and when they were brought about. This is an excellent document, uh, with excellent citations, dates, um, going back to, as you can see here in the very first sentence, in about 1640, the citations are all there, um, but it also talks about uh, some of the definitions of those uh, acronyms that we talked about in episode three. So take a look at that. Um, it's a great document. You can find this document here at svc.org slash assets slash file slash history a dot pdf. Uh, I'll just leave that there for a moment for you to get that down if you like. And if you want to, you can find Ron Willie at Willie Optical, W I L L E Y optical.com. He also has two books, uh, a couple of books out, more than a couple of books out. Um, his most recent ones, uh, Practical Design of Optical Thin Films and Practical Production of Optical Thin, Thin Films. These two particular books go along with his. Uh, training course that he does in Charlevoix, Michigan every year, I think twice a year. You'll have to check his website for the dates and uh, when he's available, when the next uh, training course is available. You can also find when that is uh, at Willie Optical, W-I-L-L-E-Y optical.com. And check out his books, excellent books. I don't own copies, um, but I have seen them over the years, great books. A couple of um, other books he's got, Practical Design and Production of Optical Thin Films, and so on. So check out his website, willieoptical.com, and check out his books. Okay, and uh, make sure you send me what you think the acronyms or the definitions of those acronyms are um, for the different vapor deposition technologies. Okay? The next thing I want to talk about is I was uh, visiting a, a customer a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe a week and a half ago, and uh, they do ophthalmic lenses, uh, AR coatings on eyeglasses. And we talked a little bit about, uh, where's my glasses? I, we talked a little bit about that, I believe it was in episode one. And uh, you can see the AR coating here, it's a little bit greenish. Um, I received one email about that way back when I did episode one. And it's important to, um, to an ophthalmics lab doing air coatings on eyeglasses that the color is very, very consistent uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you want to make sure that if both of these lenses, which are, you know, in my case, are very simple uh, prescriptions, you want to make sure that if you coat this lens on one day and this lens on the next day that I go in and buy a pair of glasses they'll match the color, uh, the coating on them. Uh, in some cases, if you look at a lens from Nikon, if you look at a lens from Essilor, if you look at a lens from Zeiss, that color is very specific to those companies and they want, uh, I guess you would call it brand recognition from the color of their AR coatings. And so it's very, very important for uh, color consistency and color uh, to match the coating design the way it stands. One of the things that pops up from this is um, typically in ophthalmic coating labs, uh, when a design is, is pushed out into production, it's done on a lens uh, 
that's made out of a material called CR39. CR39 has a refractive index uh, of about 1.5 at, uh, at 550. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Let me change this. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Okay, let's open up my ophthalmic AR. Ophthalmic green. Okay, typically that's what um, an ophthalmic AR coating curve looks like from 400 to 700 nanometers. It's got uh, approximately 1% reflection at around 540, 550, whatever the case may be, in order for uh, to have that kind of green uh, look to it. Uh, it's part of the uh, marketing, I guess, for the companies that uh, develop these AR coatings. Um, some of the coatings that are coming out now are starting to look blue, and uh, they're being marketed to people for different reasons. Um, but as you can see, if we go into the film indices, you can see I have um, a design that's using SiO2 and TiO2 on CR39. Now CR39 with an index of, uh, of approximately 1.5 at around 550. If I change that to uh, polycarbonate, polycarbonate is um, what they call shatter resistant. And so if you're making safety glasses, uh, prescription safety glasses, polycarbonate is used. Uh, from what I understand, um, in the United States, a, uh, children under the age of 16, uh, by law, um, have to have their lenses made out of polycarbonate for safety uh, and so on. I don't know if that's state by state or if that's federal law, but uh, that's what I understand. So now polycarbonate has a, a different refractive index than CR39. And so if we calculate that out, we can see that the color is going to be slightly different. And here we run into problems. Um, when we're trying to uh, do a coating run, and we have a whole bunch of lenses in there that are either CR39, polycarbonate, maybe even uh, high index, 1.74 index uh, plastic in there for eyeglasses, uh, the color shifts. And the only way around that is to separate the product uh, and do separate coating runs uh, with separate coating designs for each product, for each refractive index. And so as you can see here, very simply, um, you can't put all these in. You're always going to have a little bit of a color shift uh, in your products or in your coating runs. Let's just take a quick look at what that would be if we had 1.74. Oops. I don't think I have 1.74 in here. No, I don't. Okay. Let's just 1.74. Okay. Calculate that out. Now you see a huge shift. And so you'll always see this. There's no way around it uh, for those of you working in ophthalmics, um, in the ophthalmist coding lab. Uh, you're always going to see this color shift, and there's no way around it. Um, another thing that I wanted to address about this is uh, the Newton's rings that you get from um, Uh, now, this isn't an ophthalmic lens. This is just a, a lens with Newton's rings on there. But uh, in some cases, what ophthalmic lab uh, coders see is the Newton's rings. And you get this um, when the dip coating or the spin coating uh, applied to protect the lens, which is a scratch-resistant coating, or um, a dip or a spin coating needs to be applied to a material like polycarbonate because it's very, very soft. Um, it's also uh, uh, can be wiped away or, or ruined with uh, acetone with specific cleaners. So it has to have a protective uh, coating applied, um, typically dip or spin. And what happens is if the thickness of the 
coding. If the thickness of the coding, let me go to my board here. If this is your lens, this is the back surface here, the back surface there, and uh, let's say this is polycarbonate, it needs a spin coating, or the whole uh, lens has been dipped. If the spin coating, I'm going to exaggerate the scale for this, if the coating varies in thickness along here, you'll get Newton's rings. Uh, it's actually a, a very classic example of, of what Newton's rings is and how Newton's rings works. Uh, the variation of the thickness, um, specifically with polycarbonate, you have a uh, refractive index of the polycarbonate, but then you also have a refractive index of the spin or dip coating that you're applying. And so you're going to have these interference effects across here. Typically, uh, spin coatings and dip coatings are three or four or five uh, microns um, in thickness. And if it varies, if you have 3.5 microns thickness here and uh, 3.8 microns thickness there, you're going to get this interference effect as you look through the lens or see the reflection of the lens and start to see Newton's rings. On top of that, then you've got your AR coating applied to that. So now you've got your green color AR coating, you've got your Newton's rings uh, coming from that Newton's rings effect from the varying thickness of the spin coating, and then you've, your color is off because now you're applying a, an AR coating designed for CR39 at a refractive index of 5, or sorry, 1.5 on polycarbonate, which I believe has a refractive index of just over 1.6, or maybe even a high index plastic, which is 1.74. So in the ophthalmic coating lab, things can be tough sometimes, uh, and your colors might not come out right. But that's, that's why you get the Newton's rings. That's why you get the different colors um, on the different lenses. And uh, really, there's no way around it. Um, when I was working in ophthalmics, we tried very hard to make sure that this thickness of the, of the dip coating or the spin coating remained the same. But it's very, very difficult as each lens is almost a, almost every lens is its own prescription. And when you're dipping or spinning uh, protective coating on there, um, the actual geometry of the lens, it could be a very, very deep curve. It could be a very, very flat curve. And so you have to uh, take that into account that dipping and or spinning that in a spin coating machine, you're going to have um, different thicknesses because the spin coater or the dip coater is set up for kind of a standard or average shaped lens. So unfortunately, uh, at the moment, there's no way around it. I'm sure somebody's working on it somewhere and, uh, and we'll find a, a solution for that. Until then, uh, you have to um, have different colors in the same coating run unless you separate all of your products. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions about that, any uh, feedback about that, you can get a hold of me at DaveTaddy at CodersTech.com. You can go to my website, CodersTech.com, and uh, go to the contact page and email me. I'll fill out the form there. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is UNESCO is proposing that the 2015 is going to be the year of light, which is excellent. Uh, I got this the other day. This is from, I think, mid-October. Um, the International Year of Light from UNESCO. And this is going to be great uh, for our industry. Um, having gone uh, worked in this industry for almost 25 years now in optics, and uh, specifically optical thin films, um, being in meetings with uh, production managers and uh, general managers, um, you know that sometimes that this industry is not really uh, given its due um, by whether it's government or other industries that uh, that rely on, on 
optics and thin films. Uh, if you look these days, optics and thin films are everywhere. Um, the headlight in your car, uh, for example, it's been engineered. A lot of time and a lot of energy has been put into engineering the headlight in your car, the, the color temperature of the, of the bulb itself, the coatings inside. Maybe it needs to have uh, UV blocking coatings to block UV from being uh, shot out of the front of your car at <laughs> the drivers coming at you. Um, the actual reflector of the headlight uh, you know, behind the bulb, making sure that the beam is, is proper coming out. Everywhere you look, uh, there's optics and thin films these days. Uh, your cell phone, the camera in your cell phone. Most of your cell phone has been in a, in a vacuum uh, encoded. Uh, the LCD, the LEDs in there, they're all um, optics and, and thin films uh, requiring light. And so it's excellent that UNESCO is coming out with this, uh, 2015. Hopefully it goes through. Um, this is a prospectus, an international year of light and light-based technologies. Uh, you can find it at the UNESCO site. Um, this is going to help everybody in this industry. I, I really hope so. Uh, it'll make it more uh, understood that optics are everywhere. and to the future, really. Optics are the future of everything, in my opinion. They're going to be everywhere. And remember, uh, I've always said this, uh, you can make any optical device you like uh, to do anything you want, but it's never going to work without the coatings. So those of you uh, in coding, optics won't work without you. Just keep that in mind. So the, you can find this at the UNESCO site. It's going to help. I was in education for a while. I taught uh, vacuum and thin films. Um, at uh, Niagara College in Welland, Ontario. Uh, you know, they're always looking for funding. It's education. Um, our education system here in Canada, and I know in the United States, can be heavily underfunded, uh, which is a terrible thing. So this hopefully will help. Um, take a look at it. It's an excellent document. And uh, 2015, the year of light. Okay. Okay, so uh, I guess the last thing on my list here is a couple of pictures that I had sent to me. Uh, one I took and one I had sent to me. Um, I was out uh, canvassing the neighborhood, so to speak, uh, talking to clients, talking to potential clients and customers. Um, here uh, around where I live, there's quite a few uh, businesses that uh, do optics and coatings. And I stopped in just to say hello to somebody, and uh, they brought me into the back to take a look around. They had uh, renovated the entire uh, optic shop, and uh, the general manager wanted to show me around. And I found this little uh, darling, which I really, really like. Let's see here. Um, I'm just going to share that with you. There we go. This little bell jar. It's it was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, look at the the way it looks. The lights, the you know, the heaters on there. Uh, just as simple as you can get. The glass. They must never use it. Um, I know he said he only uses it about once a month, but I mean, just look. It's beautiful. It's clean. <laughs> um, one of the things I like about my job is that. Uh, some of the equipment you come across is like this. Uh, you know, I've worked on some really, really old machines, some really, really new machines, uh, and uh, to come across this, this nice little glass bell jar, it's very classical and, and maybe ties in with the, uh, the document I talked about earlier from uh, Don Maddox, the, the history document, because uh, this is how they used to do it, a glass bell jar, uh, pump it out, and you can see everything. You don't have to look through a little people and stuff like that. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you was uh, a picture of glass, Google Glass. Uh, I don't know if any of you follow this uh, technology, but Google has come up with a product called Glass, and it's a, um, a little display screen and camera that sits above your head. Let me see if I can find a picture of Google Glass. And there, there's, uh, there he is. There's the founder of, 
of one of the founders of Google wearing Google Glass. You can see it's a little camera here, a little screen that sticks out, and you just kind of look up above, and you can see a uh, display that's coming out of you know, the electronics that are here. The light comes out here, and you can see right here there's a little partial reflector, a uh, silvered partial reflector. Um, so that you can see through it and you can see what's being displayed on the screen there. And uh, somebody emailed me and asked me what this was here. And this is a picture of uh, a metal coating failing on Google Glass. So I was really interested in this because Google Glass is uh, a prototype uh, product right now. And so, as always, as we all know, we go through uh, prototype problems, and in this case, Google got this back from the customer. Um, looks like uh, probably silver um, didn't have a very good adhesion layer, or the, the humidity got to it and started to bubble up and come off. Um, very, very kind of interesting picture this guy sent me, and, and why he thought of me. He's not even in the optics industry. Uh, he must have found me and uh, emailed me this and asked me if if this was something that he did or if it was uh, a production manufacturing problem and that it uh, wanted to know if uh, Google would replace it and, and they did for him. Okay, that's all I have for you today. It's been a short one, I think. Uh, I just wanted to catch up on some feedback, some emails, talk about um, some other things going on. Uh, next episode, we'll catch up on our um, design series. I'll get back to uh, partial reflectors and talk about those. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, uh, if you want to send me your definitions of uh, the acronyms used for uh, vapor deposition, you can do so at coders tech, uh, Dave Taddeo at coderstech.com. Uh, go to ftgsoftware.com, check out their uh, products, their design suite of software. Um, putting all of this into place, it really does. It takes a little bit of work, and it's not a lot of work, uh, but it does take a little bit of work to get these installed on the various computers uh, within the lab, within the within engineering and so on, have them all connected to the server, which most companies do, most labs do. They have it all, all these computers connected to the server anyway. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me about those products. Go to uh, willyoptical.com, W-I-L-L-E-Y optical.com. Check out Ron Willie's books. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.